Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, have uh, two speakers. Um, we have Ohad and Guy, and they are going down to Uppsala this week to give uh, talks at uh, Splash, at, the at Uppsala, the technical track of, uh, uh, of Splash, and they're uh, giving us a little preview today. Um, Ohad Shaham is a PhD student at Tel Aviv University under the supervision of Muli Sagif, who's here visiting, and Aran Yahav at the Technion. Uh, his PhD dissertation addresses questions of checking out emissity of concurrent collection operations. And prior to his thesis, uh, he worked at IBM Haifa Research Group uh, on hardware verification. Uh, Guy Golan Goeta, who's sitting in the uh, in the audience here, is a PhD student also at Tel Aviv University under also the supervision of Muli and Iran. And he's interested in various aspects of concurrency. In the past, he was a software architect on several software projects and was responsible for the design and development of many high-performance critical systems. So we welcome them here today. And Ohad will get started. And uh, then we'll hear from Guy. OK. Thank, well, you, ver thank you very much, Tom. OK, so I'll present the work, uh, Testing Atomicity of Composed Concurrent Operation. It is a joint work with uh, Nathan Bronson, Alex Eichen, Muli Sagiv, Marin Vachev, and Aran Yav. OK, so uh, writing concurrent data structure is hard. Therefore, we are lucky that modern programming language provides us with a library of concurrent data structure. And we can use this library using an interface. Guarantees that each one of the operations of the interface is atomic. The problem is that, that in many cases, this interface is not enough. And the user needs to write a new operation, compose a few operations of the interface. And we know that each one of these operations is atomic. However, we don't know whether this compose operation is atomic. So the question is, how can we test the atomicity of this compose operation? So here, here we have an example of a bug we found in Apache Tomcat. In uh, Tomcat version 5, they have an attribute, a map attribute that maps from a name of an attribute to the object of an attribute. And they allocated a sequential hash map. And they also have a function remove attributes that gets a name, a name of an attribute. And what it does, it first, it holds the global log of, a, of ATTR. Then it checks whether the attributes in, inside the collection. And in case that it does, it gets the attribute object, remove it from the collection, and return it. And otherwise, it just returns null. OK, so the environment that this function tries to maintain is that remove attributes returns the value it removes from the collection or null. So what they did in Tomcat version 6, they said, OK, we have a concurrent hash map, a concurrent collection. So let's go allocate a concurrent hash map. And we know that each one of this, <laughs> that each one of this operation is atomic. So they just went and removed this lock. OK, and of course, this breaks the invariant. And let's see an example of, a of an execution that show that the environment the environment does not hold. We start running remove attribute with an input string A. And it's assigned to val now. And then we have some concurrent execution by a different thread that goes and does a put operation with the same, with, a, with an input key A and an object O. And then remove attributes continue running. It checks whether A is inside the collection. And of course, it does because it was added in here. So it enters the branch, and it gets the object O that was added in here. And before we have a remove operation, we have some other thread that comes and does a concurrent remove operation to the same input key A. And then remove attributes continue running. Here it tries to remove A, but it fails because it was already removed in here. So it continues running, return val, and the val it returns is the val that it reads in here which is O. Okay, so actually, 
this function run, it didn't remove anything, and it returned all it is it is as if this is the value that was removed. Right? And of course, it violates the, the invariant. So by atomicity in this work, I mean linearizability. And by linearizability, I mean that given a concurrent execution, as the one that you can see in here, we say that this execution is linearizable. If there exists a sequential execution built by this operation, the remove attribute put and remove, such that each operation in this, in this concurrent execution, the result of each operation in this concurrent execution is equivalent to its corresponding operation in the sequential execution. And if I'm looking at this concurrent execution, then I, as we said before, remove attribute returns O. You can see that put in here returns null because this is the first operation. Okay, in here the collection is empty, therefore it returns null. And remove returns O because this is the value that was added in here. So what I want to do now, I want to check whether there exists a sequential execution such that every operation in the concurrent execution has the same return value as in the sequential execution. So actually we have here three options. The first one, first do a put, then a remove, and at the end run remove attributes. And you can see that Put, as before, returns now because this is the first operation. Remove returns O because it runs just after, after, put, after the put. However, when I'm running here, remove attributes, you can see that in this point, the collection is empty because I added the key A and then I removed it. So it runs and it just returns now, unlike it is in here. So this is not the equivalent sequential execution in here. We first run remove attributes, and again it returns null because this is the first that's running in the collection is empty. So it's not the equivalent one. And in here we first run put, and then remove attributes. And you can see that remove attributes in here returns O as in here. However, the remove that we run at the end returns null because this remove uh, operation from remove attributes already remove this. Uh, the, the key A, therefore, the collection is empty and the operation returns now. Okay? Therefore, this concurrent execution is, is non-linearizable. Okay? We didn't find any sequential execution that's equivalent to this concurrent execution. Okay, so what we want to do here is testing the linearizability of this composed operation. Previously, we wanted to check the atomicity. By atomicity, we mean linearizability. So in the previous slide, sorry. Yeah. So when you say sequential, you really mean coarse grain or leaving. So here you, I mean here you still, um, if I think of sequential, I think of the first two columns. The third one, you actually have some concurrency, right? I mean in, in the sense that yeah. you're interleaving the execution, the full execution, but it's sequential in the sense that you, you execute methods completely. Yeah. But, but it's still, it still has some aspect of concurrency. I mean in the granularity of the operation. Yes. Yeah, I ran yeah. in the granularity of operation. I have the operation, then another one, and then another right. one. So operations yeah. are not preempted. Yeah. Operations are not preempted, but threads can be preempted. Right. Yeah. But threads can yeah. Be what happens to your definition if remove doesn't tell you whether it succeeds or what it removes? You need the return value of uh, the operation in order to define. Yeah. Okay, so what do you want to do? We want to test the ability of this compose operation. Okay, so looking at this trace as we saw before, it looks very easy to understand why we have a violation. However, reconstructing this in Tomcat is extremely challenging. Okay, Tomcat is a huge program. We have a large traces, a large number of traces. And this violation occurs only because we have this remove operation that works on the key A and occurs between this get operation and this remove operation that works on the same key. Right, we read here the value, and before we remove it, someone else came and removed it. Okay, and this thread interleaving, this thread interleaving is very, very rare because we need somehow that the program will do a remove operation between these two. Three of them should work on the same key. It's very, very hard to reconstruct this uh, operation. So our solution has three phases. 
The first phase, we use modularity. We actually chop this composed operation out of the program, and we test it in an environment that does arbitrary collection operation. Of course, this is an abstraction. And it generates simple traces. It can, of course, it may, of course, generate false alarms, violations which are not feasible in the client. And it also helps us the modularity to control the environment. Now we control the environment. We can do any operation that we want in the environment, and we can do to the, we can direct it and do some partial order reduction. The second thing is after we generated so many traces, we use the generalizability of the base collection. We have a guarantee from the library that each one of operation, the operation is generalizable. Therefore, we can execute the operation of the collection uh, sequentially. We do not need to overlap them because we know that they are linearizable. So this restricts some of the traces that we generated in here. And the last thing, we use the influence specification of the library. Influence is similar to the non-commutativity. Uh, non and we use this information in order to further restrict the traces that we generate. And later on, I see, I'll show what we, how we use it and what we mean. OK, so first, modular checking. As I said, we, test the, we take this compose operation, we chop it out of the program, and we test it in an environment that does operation on the collection. Between any two operations of the compose operation, we can do any operation of the environment that we want to do. Uh, this is, of course, as I said, an abstraction. It may generate false alarm. However, uh, we argue that the violation that we found, even though are not, are not feasible in the client, fixing these violations make the code, resi the code resilient for future changes. Because if, for example, this bug is currently not feasible, then in two days from now, someone can remove a lock in another part of the program or add some remove operation, and this bu bug can pop up. And later on, you'll see that this is something which is backed up by our user experience, that some of the bugs we found were not feasible in the client. But even though we reported them, we reported them to the developer, they acknowledged these in bugs and fixed them. So you yeah, should sure. have some sort of theorem, at least. Well, maybe theorem is strong. But you would hope that the sort of bugs you find here are a superset of what would happen in the application, given if your environment, if your modular and environment abstraction is is uh, sound, right? Mm -hmm. That that you'll that you'll get a you'll bound the set of errors um, due to misuse, yeah. right? The, the, this, the, this is more to make. And later on, I'll talk about some some way we use it to to prove. But yeah. OK, so first, as I said, we do a modular checking. So what we want to do, we want to test this linearizability of this compose operation in a modular fashion. OK, so actually what we can do, we just run the program in a testing method. We run the remove attributes with some random inputs. There might be an environment operation that doesn't influence the control of the compose operation. Some doesn't influence the control of the compose operation. But then it's running and running and running, and it doesn't find any bugs because still it's generated. There are, whoa, OK, something with the computer. It's, there are so many traces that we can explore in here. And at the end, when it eventually finds a bug, we look at the trace, ignore this one, which will be in here. We can look at this trace, and we can see, as I said before, the reason that we found this bug is that this remove operation influenced the result of this remove operation. Because this remove operation removed the key A before this remove operation, this remove operation failed to remove R. Sorry, R. It failed to remove R, and therefore, we discovered the violation. So, um, so what we actually do we further restrict the environment to do operation, only operation that will influence the next to come operation of the composed operation. Okay, in here, for example, before contains key, I can do a put that will make contains key to return true instead of false. In here, remove will make this remove to fail, and so on. I'm restricting to environment. This is a partial order reduction, some sort of a partial order reduction. Okay, 
that's okay, so Dylan. What's your definition of influence? I think that in, I think here, and for, uh, so this formally, formally, I mean, how do you, you're not analyzing statically, right? You're just, so you're doing like a dynamic part dynamic. of the reduction? Yeah, dynamically. When the, when the program is running, between every two operations, I can have an environmental operation. Yeah. So when I get to this, to this step, I know what my state, I know the state of the collection, and I know the semantic, I can get the semantic of the library. This, this, the influence specification of the library. I, I have this specification. I assume that someone provided it to me. Uh, I see. So okay. you know that you should like use the same key because... Exactly. exactly. Because it's a map, you know that you should use the same key. Okay. And if currently in this state, in this state I know that, that the collection is not empty and it has a, the key A inside, so I'll do a move. Otherwise, if it would be empty, I can do a put or okay. so on. Okay, it's something which is dynamically and it's, de it's dependent on the state of the collection in each state, each moment. Okay, so let's see. A running example, here we have uh, remove attributes as we saw until now. And we have here the execution itself and here you can see the, the code, the code that we're currently executing. So we start running remove attributes with the key A and we assign to value now. And now bef before we have this contains key, we ask the environment, do you want to do an operation that will influence this contained key? It's something which happens dynamically. In this case, the environment decides that it does want to do, and the collection is currently empty, so the environment does a put operation. It, it inserts the key A and the value O to the collection, and then remove attributes, continue running, and now contains key will return true because a was already added to the collection in here. So we continue running, we, we enter the branch, and before we have this get, again we ask the environment, do you want to do an operation that will influence this get? And in this case, the environment decides that it doesn't want to do, so we continue running. We do a get that reads the value O and insert it to val. And now again, before remove, we ask the environment, do you want to do an operation that will influence remove? And the environment does a remove with the same key. And of course, it will influence the result of this remove. And we continue running. And the remove failed. And at the end, it returns O. OK, and now, as we saw before, we, all, we go and we check all the possible executions and see whether there exists an equivalence, not one. And if no, we report a violation. OK? So. Just one thing, as you can see, when we got this trace from, the, from, the, from our technique, you can see that the, the trace is very, very concise. It's not a large trace of a program that runs many threads and it's very hard to, to analyze the bug. It's very, very easy. We have the compose operation and we have once in a while some small environment operation. Then it's very, very easy. All the traces that we got, it was very easy to, to see why the bug occurs and to analyze them. Okay, so we implemented this technique in a tool named Colt, and it gets as an input a program and a library specification, which are moved to the compose operation extractor. Extractor, this is a simple static analysis that goes and just uh, look for composed operation. And what after it does, it moves to the user back this candidate composed operation, and the reason is that that in many cases this compose operation builds inside of function, but in some cases the user instead of writing a function that implements a compose operation, just write this compose operation inside of a large method. So in some of the cases, uh, the user needs to manually compose this compose operation, and then it moves to the bytecode instrumentation together with some driver that runs the function and a driver that does the influence specification that the environment is. And this, of course, afterwards we run it and we either, either get a non erasability result or a timeout. Okay, because it's a testing tool. Okay, so let's see our benchmark. So we, as I said, we use this simple static analysis to extract the compose operation. In 90% of the cases, the compose operation was part of a large method. So we, we manually needed to chop it out and to write it. 
Uh, we extracted 112 composed operations out of 55 applications, all of them real composed operations, uh, and from real applications as Apache Tomcat, Cassandra, MyFSS, Trinidad, and so on. For each one of the applications, we extracted all the composed operations, and we analyzed all of them, and we didn't find any additional composed operations. We tried to use Google Code, coders, and other search engines to see whether we can find new, any additional composed operations, and this is all we found. So after we had this 100 proof of comp composed operation, we say, okay, we don't know whether these are linearizable. Yeah. This doesn't seem like a lot. It seems like two per app. Hmm? Two, you, you only found two composed operations per application yeah. on average. Yeah, on average, yeah. So is that just because these, these uh, applications are actually well written and they don't really composed things at all? Or, I mean, is the library just powerful enough so that you only need the atomic operations of the libraries? All of these are actually using the same libraries. All of these are concurrent hash maps. So it's the same libraries. I... So I don't really understand how you sort of figured out whether or not there's other composed operations that you missed. Because you have to know the semantics of the code in order to determine whether something is a composed operation. No, actually, we define, we, you see whether there is an operation that try to access a few operations of the library. Or oh, a single method that accesses, a single more, method than that accesses one. more than one, yeah. But if they, I mean, there could be bugs in the code where they have composed operations hidden because they use other helper methods that do the That's library true. access, That's so you wouldn't true. miss those. We, we try to we try to find, we didn't find any of these, but there might be a case that we missed such, but we also tried to find these kinds and we didn't. Most of these compose operations actually didn't have additional methods that, that they call during the run, so, but there might be a case that, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, so after finding these 112 compose operations, we say, okay, let's see whether these are linearizable or not, so we ran cult, and it terminated on each one of, and it said that 59 are non-linearizable, and for each one of them it terminated in like a second or so, and, and it gave it rest and everything, and 33, it just timed out after a while and didn't say anything. Then you say, okay, so we know that 59 are really non-linearizable, non but does they really non-linearizable, or they are, are they non-linearizable only due to our open environment? Okay, uh, the abstraction we did. So we check it out and we saw that 17, 17 are non erasable only due to our environment, and 42 are non erasable in the client them themselves. And for each one of them, we wrote a fix and we reported them to the developers of the tool, and many of them were already fixed and acknowledged as violation. And many of these acknowledged as violations as well and also were fixed. How do you determine this? Do you actually find a real counterexample in the actual code, or no. by looking at the code? In, in some, we were managed to construct, but not in most of them. Uh, in many cases, we, we got a feedback from the user. And in some of the cases that we were not sure, we look whether there, there exists whether there exists an operation that that can occur in, uh, in that can occur and create a violation itself. Okay, but, uh, but in, in most of the cases, we just got an acknowledge from the user. Okay, so, uh, okay, so afterwards, we said, okay, we know that first, for 53, we got a timeout result, so let's see whether these are linearizable or not. So we checked them manually, and we saw that 27 of them are linearizable. We were managed to prove them are linearizable, and 36 as global which means they are not encapsulated, and they, are not, they do not have only the collection itself. As global, they also have some other, other variables. And this variable controls the value that this compose operation insert to the, to the collection during the run. And if we'll augment the environment, that instead of doing only operation of the collection, that the, it will do op uh, only operation on the global SM, but will change the value, then we can generate traces to show that these are non linearizable as well. So overall, out of the 112 composed operation, we actually found that 85 are non linearizable 
So how many of the non-linearizable cases did the developers dispute and say, well, yeah, it's non-linearizable, but that's okay? None. They either, I guess that the one that didn't respond. <laughs> okay. I guess this was the case. All the one that responded was, many of them then said thanks, so, that so, acknowledged so, them as bug. Okay, so nobody had some other... No, uh, no. In, in Cassandra, for example, they responded to say, oh, this bug is currently not feasible because remove can happen only when when the program terminates and it's not probably anymore. However, we will fix it because we, we plan to do changes, so they acknowledge this as a bug that can pop up in the future, but I guess the one that didn't respond, yeah. Okay, so 85 of these are non-linearizable and 27 are, non are linearizable. Is that said, okay, we found many bugs, many real uh, violation, many real violation, and it was very easy to detect them. And we only use the influence specification of, of the library. For example, I mean, if we have some, some branch which is depend on the value to check if the value is equal to 40, 42, then go and do some violation, this is something that we would miss. But then looking at, at this compose operation, we saw that these are very generic. I mean, they get some input, they use it inside the collection, they do not have any branch of the input, and also, when they got some return value from the collection operation, uh, the only branch that they do is whether some key is inside the collection or if it doesn't inside the collection. We also do, they have some remove a get so that we check they checked if the value is equal to null or different than null. Okay, the, it doesn't check some specific value. So we define the notion of data independent, and informally, data independence means that. A compose operation is that independent if the only global is the collection itself. Uh, if the input key, in the, if the input is used only as a key in the collection operation, and if the branches, all the branches in the compose operation are only based on the result of the collection, and only check whether the key is inside the collection or not. And we use this notion to show that uh, verifying atomic uh, linearizability of this data independent compose operation is decidable when the local state is bounded. Okay, and the reason is that uh, if I know that a collection, a compose operation is data independent, then I know that if there exists, a, if a bug, a violation exists for a certain key, then a bug exists for each key. Okay, so actually I need to check it out only a single input key. I'm doing some small model reduction. I run it only on a single input key. And I also know that this is the single input key. And I know that it is data independent. So basically, I know that the compose operation will at most add one value to the collection. The value can be at most dependent on this single input key, the value that is calculated. So actually, the compose operation can insert one key with only one value to the collection. And if I'm looking at the influence specification, I know that the, inf the operation that influence an operation of the compose operation that use the single input key will use the same single input key. And when I want to do an influence, I need to write some different value, but any different value, because that independent, it will not branch on this value. So actually, this bounds the number of elements that I can have in the map because I, I either had this key and this value or this key and the value that added by the environment or the map would be empty. Okay, so we did some small model reduction and we explore all the possible execution we, using one input key and influence environment that uses a single input value. Okay. And, and then afterwards, after we did that, we said, okay, let's go back to our compose operation and see how many of them are really data independent. So in here, SCM means that they are data independent. It's, single, it's singleton concurrent map. They can use, be verified using single key. FCM is some, some extended class of these that they can be verified using a fixed set of keys. For example, if I, I have an input, and at the beginning I have if key equals null, do that, otherwise do that. So I can check it 
using an input null or, or any other input. And these are data dependent. So you can see that out of the 112 compose operation, a lot of them are data, data dependent. So it was quite, uh, and we were not quite happy. But that, then we look at these data dependence and we saw that out of these, 60 of them has globals. They are not encapsulated. And as I said before, these globals are controls the value that the compose operation add to the collection. So these are non erasable and we also have four that are non erasable and one which is erasable. This is the one that we missed. The one that we missed. So, so overall, we ran the tool and we were able to, to, to verify all these data independent compose operation and the ones that are buggy, we, we afterwards, we manually fixed them and we were able to verify them as well as correct. Okay, so this is the flow uh, of the tool, the extended flow, as before the uh, user provides the, pr the, program, uh, the program and the library specification to the compose operation, which generate a candidate compose operation and move to the user. Um, then uh, this compose operation can verify to be data independent. We didn't implement this part, but it's, we have a very simple syntactic rules that most of these uh, this compose operation satisfied. They're very, very simple. They're, they don't have any aliasing or something like that. Very, very simple. And this is, this is in case of that they, they are data independent, they move to the user, and we, the, we, then we, it is, moved, it is a model in Promela generated, and we run spin and get either reliability result or non, non reliability result. And in case that it is not an independent, then as before, we have this flow to just run testing and try to find bugs. Okay, so the overall result of the tool is that it finds 42 violations which are non linearizable in, uh, in the client, 17 are non linearizable only in open environment, uh, 26 are, are globals and therefore has globals and therefore are non linearizable. And it was able to prove using the small model reduction that I said. 26 that, uh, 26 that are linearizable, and one we missed. Okay, so I'll summarize. Uh, writing concurrent data structure is hard, and also we saw that employing this atomic library uh, operation is error prone. Therefore, what we did in here, we used modular linearizability checking and leverage influence specification and data independent in order to find violation or prove the reliability of this compose operation. And we see that we found some sweet spot because we identify important bugs. And for each one of them, we provide a trace that's not only showing the bug, but also explaining the bug. As I said before, this bug, these traces are very, very concise. It's very, very easy to understand them and to afterwards, un and to afterwards fix the compose operation uh, accordingly. And otherwise, it was very hard to find these bugs while running the program. And we also proved a serializability of several compose operations. And this is a simple and efficient technique. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I will present the work uh, automatic uh, finding and locking uh, using uh, show prep, sh shape properties, which is a joint work with uh, Nathan Bronson, uh, Alex Saikin, Ramalingam, uh, Mulisa Giv, and Rania. Uh, concurrent data structures. Concurrent data structures are widely used in many software systems, and in this work we deal with synchronization, automatic synchronization for concurrent data structures. A simple, a simple way to implement uh, synchronization for uh, concurrent data structures is to use uh, coarse gain locking. A common example can be a single lock that protects the entire data structure. Uh, the good thing about such uh, uh, synchronization is that it is easy to implement and understand such locking, but the bad thing is that it is, uh, provides a very limited uh, concurrency and usually uh, provides uh, um, inefficient, uh, inefficient, uh, uh, it is not efficient enough in uh, many applications. Another way uh, is to use the uh, fang and locking. 
Uh, Fangen locking usually provides a high degree of concurrency, but uh, the problem with Fangen locking is that it is uh, very hard to understand and implement uh, such locking. So in this work, what we want to do, and we did, is to automatically add Fangen locking to data structure without synchronization. And we want to be able to handle recursive data structures like uh, uh, recursive trees and recursive uh, lists. So our goal is to take code without any synchronization and automatically create an equivalent code with Fang and Loki. We want to create, there are many ways to create Fang and Loki. So in this work, what we want to do is to create Fang and Loki in which each OIP object has its own lock. So if this is the data structure, and N1 is an object, we want N1 to have its own object and all the other objects have, uh, we want them to have their own uh, lock. We also want that uh, a lock will only held while necessary. So if, for example, 20 uh, holds some locks, we want it to be able to release locks as soon as possible, so other threads like 30 prime will also be able to simultaneously work on the same data structure. And by doing, that, by doing this, we want many threads to work on the same uh, data structure together. So in this work, we show a method uh, to add such, uh, such fine grain locking uh, by using a simple uh, source uh, translation, source to source uh, translation. And the method uh, uses a simple static analysis uh, because part of the method is dynamic. And because of that, the method is able to handle cases that are usually hard for a static analysis. Uh, the main idea of the method is to rely on the shape of shared memory for the, for the synchronization. So the method itself is not applicable in any case. It is applicable when the sh shared shape can be seen as a dynamic forest, as a forest that is dynamically changed. So, so if we are given a code, it may be a complicated code, the method doesn't really need to understand the details of the code. The method relies on the fact that at the beginning of each operation of the data structure, the shape of the data structure is a forest. Because we rely on only on the beginning of each operation, during the operation, the shape can be changed, it can be arbitrary shape, it can be a cycle. As long as at the beginning of each operation, the shape is a forest. This, this is, in this case, uh, this is the code of a balance search tree, so this is a tree, tree is a forest, so this is okay. So, in the work, we have two parts. We first uh, show a new locking protocol. Uh, we call it uh, domination locking, which is, a, which is a locking protocol for synchronization of uh, dynamic uh, IPs. And uh, it, is, it is a generalization of several other known locking protocols, like uh, end-over-end -end locking and dynamic DAG locking. And in the second part, we use this protocol. We uh, show our method to add fine gain locking by enforcing uh, the domination lock locking protocol. And we show that the method is able to handle changing cases. For example, the method is able to add effective fine gain locking to some implementations of uh, red black trees. So I'll start with the domination locking protocol. Uh, in this protocol, what we want to do is to leverage the fact that uh, in uh, well type programs like uh, Java programs, uh, the, the, there is a restricted way to access uh, objects. So if, for example, we have a thread and the stack only has pointers to the root of the data structure, to N1, then if we want to access N3, we have to first access N2. So we want to use this. And to do this, we distinguish between two types of objects. First type is exposed object and the, first, and the second type is hidden object. Exposed objects are the root, roots of the data structures. And when an operation begins, it may only point to exposed objects. Hidden objects are the other objects, and they may be reachable from the exposed objects. So we want to use this, and we want to use the idea of domination. We say, we say in, uh, in the definition of the protocol that 20 dominates object U if all the paths from exposed object to object U uh, have a lock that is locked by 3T. So in this example, we have two exposed objects, E1 and E2, and we have 3T that has a lock on H4. We know because of that that T dominates H4 and H5, because all paths from the exposed object to these two objects uh, are protected by this lock. 
we also uh, we also know that t does not dominate h3 because there is a path with, without any lock that is all by 3t. The protocol itself has uh, three uh, rules. The first rule uh, is needed to protect the access to object and says that thread can access object only when it holds the object lock. So if this is the data structure, then thread T has to hold the lock in order to access E1. The second rule say that thread can lock hidden object U only when it dominates the object. So in this example, thread T can, can lock H2 because it dominates, it dominates uh, H2. The domination locking protocol allows early unlock. So if, we, if 3T wants to uh, release uh, the lock from E1, it is able to release the lock, so other threads will be able to access the same data structure. Uh, also, the protocol can handle cycles. So if, for example, we have a cycle, as in this case, then the 3T is able to lock H3 because it dominates H3. Uh, also, the protocol allows the graph to dynamically change as long as the rules are satisfied. So it is okay that during the work of 3T, 3T will change the, will change the graph, create new object and change the pointers of, uh, of the Ibe graph. Uh, the third rule of the domination locking protocol is needed for exposed object and for this, uh, for this part, we use the simple variant of two-phase locking that uh, avoids deadlocks. So if we have such kind of data structure, we use a variant of two-phase locking for the exposed objects, and for the hidden objects, we use uh, the first two rules of the domination locking protocol. What we show in the work, that uh, the domination locking protocol guarantee atomicity of the operation, if all operations uh, fo uh, follow the protocol, but we also show that it is, only, it is only needed to consider sequential executions. So if we know that every sequential execution, if all the execution with a single thread uh, satisfy the protocol, then we know that all the operations are uh, atomic, are linear, linearizable. So if we have a code, it is enough to think about the sequential executions in order, if we want to use the protocol in order, in order to use it to enforce uh, atomicity. So we have a protocol, we know it is enough to think about sequential executions, but still the code may be complicated, and now we want a way to en automatically enforce uh, the protocol. We could do it manually, of course, but in the second part we show how to do it uh, automatically. So how to do this? Um, okay, for, for this we have our automatic uh, method. And as I said at the beginning, that uh, the method is, works only in uh, some cases. It works if we know that the shape of the data structure is a dynamic forest, and the definition is that in every sequential execution, in every execution with a single thread, the shape is a forest at the beginning and the end of each operation of the data structure. So if we have a data structure that is composed from two uh, lists, for example, uh, this uh, kind of data structure, it is okay, this is a forest, it is okay that the, such data structure will have an operation that uh, change uh, the, the graph here, for example, moves H3 from list A to list B. Such operation will violate the forest. During the operation, this is not a forest. But this is okay for a forest-based data structure as long as at the end of each such operation, the shape will be a forest. So how the method works? The method works in two steps. In the first step, it adds code that collects a runtime information. And in the second step, a step, it, it uh, adds locking that uses the runtime information for the locking. So the in the first steps, the idea is to use, to add two reference counters, uh, similar to the garbage collection uh, uh, reference counters. Um, we had the stack reference counter that counts number of reference from a uh, private memory from stack to a uh, object. And we add heap reference counter that counts number of incoming uh, pointers from a uh, heap object to uh, the current uh, object. And we add the code that manages all uh, the relevant uh, things that, uh, in, we add the code that manages the reference counters in the code. So if this is our uh, state, for example, H4 is a pointer from stack, so its stack reference counter is one. Uh, H2 is 
and e preference counter here is zero because there is no pointer uh, from uh, e object. And here h2 has two pointers from e object. And, stack, uh, reference, and because of this, stack, its e preference counter is two. And its stack reference counter is zero because there is no pointer from stack. So how we use uh, the reference counters? What we do is a very simple thing. We lock object when we see that its e counter its stack counter become, becomes positive. So as long as an object is pointed by a by, by thread, the thread acquires its, uh, the lock of the object. And we unlock object when its stack counter becomes zero and, and uh, it, the object itself is not part of a forest violation because we want to handle violations of uh, the forest. And we can see this easily by looking at the heap counter. So, and we have another thing that in some operations we may have an operation that works on a few objects. And at the beginning, the stack counter of both of them is, uh, is one. And we want to lock them without leading to deadlock. So what we do is to lock them in a fixed order. So we can, for example, take the addresses and lock them according to the order of the addresses. We know that we can ident identify them statically at the beginning of the operation. So if we follow these two steps, then we create a data structure with find and locking uh, that follows domination locking. So in the work, we, we wanted to understand, we want to evaluate the method by uh, adding find and locking to several data structures. And we did it for two balanced uh, search trees uh, for a trip, which is a balanced search tree that uses uh, randomization. randomization. And uh, we added the uh, find and locking to red black tree with top down uh, rebalancing without any parent pointers. And we also did it for self adjusting IP, skew IP, and for two specialized uh, data structures. And we did and, uh, in a, a priori application in the Barsant uh, algorithm. And we checked the, and we evaluate the results in the context of the application themselves. And according to the runtime experiments, the results uh, were uh, quite good. We show a uh, good scalability. Uh, although we, we could use many optimizations because we used, uh, here we used a uh, very simple locking. We could, um, we, we could optimize uh, the locking in many, many ways. We didn't do it. We just uh, tested the pure method. And, the, and without any optimization, the results uh, uh, seem to be uh, good. In some cases, we evaluated the effect, uh, the, our locking. Uh, we compared the locking to manual, uh, to manual find and locking. Here, we have a graph of the, that compares the manual find and locking to automatic find and locking. We have also a, a trip. We have a, this is a graph related to trip. Here, we have a single lock. And here, we have manual find and locking versus our automatic locking. The results uh, were uh, almost equivalent. Uh, in no, not in all cases the results were equivalent, but in many cases we saw that manual and uh, automatic is uh, the same. In one case, we, haven't, we, have, we even found uh, end over end locking in the original application, in the a priori application. And we compared the original uh, end over end locking to the automatic, uh, uh, to our automatic method. And we, show, and we, we saw that the, locking, the both methods are equivalent, but in one case here, our automatic method uh, provides a better uh, throughput. Uh, it was surprising, but uh, this was uh, the result. Okay, a summary in the work, we show a new find and locking protocol for dynamic IPs, and uh, we show an automatic way to, an application for the protocol, which is an automatic way to uh, add find and locking. Uh, by relying on the uh, shape of a data structure. And we show a preliminary performance evaluation for uh, this uh, implementation. And thank you. So you do a shape analysis then of the method, assuming that you're a forest? And you do some static analysis, or you just do the runtime check to see it's not the forest? In, I, I could use the runtime check, but I didn't do it. What I, what I did is to, the, 
I, the programmer, say that this is the forest-based data structure, mm -hmm. and then I apply the method. So there's no shape analysis really going on here, static shape analysis? No. I see. So, so basically I, I assert, and then the analysis sort of just believes that it's going to be a forest. Yes. I see. But you do have some dynamic check, you said. You, you check dynamically that uh, the heap reference count is... Yes, I could check dynamically that every, the first time I, uh, I see an object, the heap reference counter is, uh, le is, is uh, one. Right. So and so I could identify a violation of the forest, but uh, yeah. I didn't I, I didn't do it because I, I knew that the data structures are uh, forest based. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the instrumentation you have to add to keep track of the uh, stack references and the heap references is that restricted to the data structure you're actually yes. doing this on, so you don't have to go and instrument everything. Yes, only for the data. It is only restricted to the data structure. It, it has to be restricted to the data structure because I don't want to be affected by external pointers. I want to ignore them. So, I mean, you have to, do you check that, for example, the internal nodes of these trees don't escape into the... Yes, I assume that the ob all the objects are encapsulated in that structure. Okay, thank you gentlemen. Okay.